the fur trade, the fur traders, and we're talking when the Hudson's Bay Company was created in 1670, what they wanted was the undercoat of this animal. And when I hold this animal up, what I'm going to do is I will kind of pull the guard here as bad, see if I can get this light here. And what you're going to see is a dark brown chocolate hair underneath the long guard hairs. You can see more of this undercoat here in the belly, but that wasn't as high quality as this right here. <laughs> I know, kind of a little hard. Yeah, pretty soft, isn't it? You know, they used to call that soft gold because to the fur trader, it was as good as gold. Now, why? You know, what motivated Hudson's Bay Company in 1670 when it was created to go across the North American continent and eventually build Fort Squally? coming to this area. What was their motivation? Well, it was beaver and the undercoat of the beaver. But the finished product of this undercoat was what? Does anybody know? Yes. Very good. <laughs> Donna? Mm -hmm. Now, I would, well, Ashley, <clears throat> could you put on your topper and come up here? Now, I have to understand, if I was 1855, and I'll slip in and out of 1855 a lot, so please excuse me if I start feeling like, what's the guy title? This was a wonderful, I saw, well, you said it was fit, fit use. Often these old hoppers were quite small because 150 years ago, most of our ancestors were small. quite small. Okay? Not now, much brain. <laughs> but it's a wonderful. I wanted Donna to show, I mean, it's even, you know, you know, you know it went beyond me. Yeah. See, I found one. See, mine's got a little tattered edge. I have the box. Do you have the box? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> this one here was crushed, as a matter of fact. Oh. I had to fix it, yeah. Because number one, I have, I have a big head. And it's hard to find one to fix. But that's what's the first one. All I did was put the one on. Thank you, John. Yeah, that's a wonderful example of the beaver felt topper. Because there was a time when men had to wear hats all the time. And you, you know, if you lived in a state like this, let's say this is in England, and you wanted to go to the state down the road a few miles, and it rains a lot in England, you had to have a hat that could stand up to the rain. So these beaver felt poppers fit the middle. Because that undercoat of the beaver is waterproof, very resilient, and also reflected your social status in life. Men don't wear hats anymore. Or, you know, and they wear hats. <laughs> they wear these stick ball caps. You know, and then they call it town ball. What do you call it? Baseball. 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 Just a ridiculous game. <laughs> in 18, uh, early 1840s, when Charles Wilk came to Puget Sound down Fort Squally, the Americans went out there and played stick ball in front of the British. And the British thought it was silly. Some, you know, strange derivative of cricket. They hit a ball and run around the bases. And, you know, back then that you could an out was when the ball bounced one time. You caught it on the bounce, one out. Today, of course, catching the fly. Uh, the British thought it was silly, and their attitude was this game will never survive. Obviously, we'll go back to cricket, the proper English game. So, let's look at a few pictures. And we'll talk more about the court. I should turn off the lights here. Let me see. I may have to have somebody serve as my button pusher. <laughs> that advances it. So I give the high sign. Yeah, it reverses it. Push that one, and I'll give you the high sign. I'll point to Jared. Jared, I'll point to Jerry. A few. This is a, a national Curtis photo, by the way. You're familiar with the Curtis Brothers. Down its original site, actually, when we're in Point Plants Park, you guys are closer to the original site than we are. This country here should look familiar. A lot of us don't realize it's some future sound, but you down here are more familiar. I, I understand maybe you throughout the edge will hard to see. Let's see if I can stand on the way. The motivation for the Hudson's Bay Company to build this, its fort in the southern future sound is prairie country. This is Spanaway Prairie. Um, they want to build a fort, a, a fort in the forest, like you see in Point Plants Park today. Obviously, they want to field a vision. 
Um, so this is a good, a good example of how Fort Scully would have looked and was built in the 1830s. Jerry? This is Fort Scully in about the late 1800s. And this is the best photo evidence we have of the fort at its original site. And what you see is the Palisades are already gone. You're seeing a bastion. You see Dr. Ptolemy's house here behind locust trees. You see the granary, warehouse number two, and the gable end of warehouse number one, which is the great store in Fort Squally. Today, this location is, if you go still at DuPont, exit there on I-5, take a right where Northwest Landing is. Take a right there, kind of go back up that frontage road towards Stillicum. When you see the big signs that say Northwest Landing, take a left. Go about three quarters of a mile, and you'll eventually go over what's left of Squamish Creek. And you see the field, and you'll still see the locust tree standing. And that's where Fort Squally was originally built. Not prairie country. In fact, there's more prairie country. There's more prairie country back then than there is today. Because the Native Americans were the number one, first of all, the glacial prairie. And the Native Americans actually kept the, the, the uh, prairie country maintained through burning because it was camas bulb and deer and elk that would feed in that area. Old growth forest is not good deer and elk habitat. Why? Great canopy, nothing grows below, below it. So the Native Americans actually, that's what attracted the Hudson's Bay Company. So in many ways, you guys are more associated with this historic area than we are in this part. Jerry, you're doing a good job the park. Now we have two buildings at Point Defines Park that you will find today. One of them is Dr. Palmy's house, or the large house, as we call it. Uh, this is the movement up to Point Defines Park, and these are pictures from the 19, uh, about 1920s for this movement to Point Defines Park. This building here, Yankee Cottage style. Next picture. 1955, I should say that. And then the granary. <coughs> and this building is finished, and it was put to use in January of 1851. This building here may be the oldest standing wooden structure in the state of Washington. Both of these buildings are located in Point Park today. Right here are the last known residents of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but what you see is two different styles of construction because the Fort Squally was built there in 1833. By the way, Fort Squally was the first permanent non native settlement on Creek Island. This Fort Squally. That's where it all began. It was the Oregon Territory. The British wanted it, the Americans wanted it. In 1846, the issue was settled and they would divide the Oregon Territory. So in 1833, this is built in traditional Hudson's Bay Company style. It's called uh, French scribe or post and sail style of construction, hand hewn timbers. And you'll see this style mimicked in a lot of Hudson Bay Company forts. In the 1930s, what was left of Fort Squally is relocated to Point Defiance Park. And here you see some reconstruction going on. You can see the men in the 1930s using traditional methods with ads and broad axes, squaring timbers. The bastion has been reconstructed here. This is the movement of the part. Why? Because the DuPont company didn't want it there anymore. They were making dynamite at the, at the uh, original site, and they just didn't have use for it anymore. So the DuPont chemical company was allowed to use these buildings. Okay? Keep firing away. These are little blocks of time to make me refocus. Okay. Now, the Hudson's Bay Company, and I'm going to give you kind of a, a quick background here. If you understand, you talk about a fur trade monopoly. As I said, 1670 was created and still operates today. It's, in Canada, it's called the Bay Company. If anybody goes up to Canada, you shop at the Bay Company, Hudson's Bay Company. Oldest continuing stock issuing company in the world. Okay? Um, when it was by the 18th, I think this map is like circa 1832. And as you see back then, the British thought that this boundary line would drop down here. You know, here's the Puget Sound, Oregon. This is the Oregon Territory. They thought that this would be British, part of British North America. Three million square miles are under their control for the fur trade. And you see the southern and northern canoe routes. They went overland. Um, up here, Russian America, we call that Alaska. This is the, you know, the, as the world look in 1833 in Fort was built. And we talked about the fur trade, we talked about European Native American contact. And this picture here, I often bring into the classrooms in these classroom presentations. I ask the kids, I say, what evidence do you see of fur trade activity going on? And, and usually fourth graders is what, what I deal with. And they have pretty good spotting it. Did you spot the examples I see? Trigger. 
Native Americans had some issues. In fact, I see two different varieties for wet snow and uh, dry snow, thin and narrow. They have that figured out. Okay? Who said clothing? Very good. The clothing. They can see cloth. These are Canada style dresses. And so you see they like clothing. Um, inside this pipe could be trade tobacco, it came from Brazil. Native Americans love tobacco. Tobacco is part of their ceremonies. Their shaman offers them sort of tobacco. But they love the tobacco the fur trade product. It came, it's called real tobacco, and actually it's the basis for a lot of the cigarette uh, tobacco we use today. It came from South America. Um, and, you know, the cravat, you look at here, this, this, this gentleman here has a frock coat on and a, a white cravat. Okay, so they're wearing European style clothes. Then the fur trade moves west. This is the that picture, by the way, I showed you about 1840. It was painted. This is a modern day. This this is a wonderful big painting. I feel like it happened in a slide, but it shows the fur trade as it moves out west. You can see the birch bark canoes. And by the way, some of these birch bark canoes can be 40 feet long and carry three and a half tons of weight. But when it came to time to portage and move around the rapids, four men could pick it up. Okay. Now you can see inside the canoes you have your Native Americans, your mixed blood, your Métis, who are European, Native American mixed, French Canadians, and right here, there's your gentleman. See with the topper here, for that. The gentleman, even when they're in the Rocky Mountains, look like the gentleman that they were. See how important that clothing was? They come out to the northwest, and then the, the complexion of the fur trade changed. You're talking now, you're talking 1670, at least you up to the early 1800s. And of course, they came out to the northwest. The Native Americans were the first peoples here. Now, here you can see what they call a flathead, but actually it's a, it's a Chinook. And they would flatten their heads. Anybody know why they would flatten their heads? Why would these people flatten their heads? Style, beauty. beauty. The Chinook are a powerful tribe. They range clear back to the Mississippi River in their activities. They had large slave populations, and they wanted to differentiate themselves from their slaves who were roundheaded. Flatten your head. You see? And uh, they put them in boards, babies, you know, on a flat board. They put a board. They would tie down. They come down on the baby's head. And just keep pressure on. And that was a sign, you're right, beauty. It's a sign of beauty. Look at the tattooing. They're right here. Is this extinct little dog. This is a painting, by the way, done by a Canadian artist by the name of Paul Kane, who painted in the 1840s. And he captured one of these extinct dogs that Native Americans would clip to make their robot. What's that? It's a Oh, okay. Yeah. But they would keep these dogs, and they would often blankets were so valuable to Native Americans, only chiefs would have them. And the chiefs would rip up their blankets and give them to other tribal members to start their own blanket. You see, then the Hudson's Bay Company arrived. Ship. You can see why you know they were eager to trade beaver pelts for these blankets. Okay, through. 18, mid 1820s, you have Fort Vancouver. The Great Depot. If you ever have an opportunity, if you haven't done it, go down and see Fort Vancouver, the U.S. National Park. <coughs> Big depot of the Hudson's Bay Company. Wonderful site. Gary? John McLaughlin. John McLaughlin. Okay. Yeah. White headed eagle. Okay. Uh, typical of the Hudson's Bay Company, English Fort, they lock let the Scots and the Irish manage. He was six foot four. In a war, at a time when, when, when you know, when you know, his physical size, you know, which was intimidating in a, in a <coughs> world where most men were five and a half tall. So he was. You know, remember what his nickname was? White-headed eagle. That's what he called himself. I like that name. Okay. And his wife, Marguerite. She was a mixed blood or no straight teeth. Okay. What's always interesting, I look at these pictures, these fur trade wise, Native American face, look at the dress. Definite, talk about change, look at the change, these people. Okay? Fort Colville, 1826, it now lays at the, what, lies at the bottom of the Banks Lake, we look back at Grand 
Cooley, 5826 for Colville.